How's everybody doing? Woohoo! Come on! All right. So anyway, thank you all very much. Uh, it's a it's an honor uh, being here with with Manu and and, and everyone else. And uh, I very much appreciate the f the fact that you had the first flag on the moon. Okay, sounds good. Congratulations. All right. So let's keep the theme going on uh, sustainability. So you know, getting to the point here, um, we have a number of objects, human-made objects orbiting the Earth. Here we have a plot that maybe some of you have seen from NASA uh, Orbital Debris Program Office, kind of showing you that this curve is not getting smaller as a function of time. We keep track of about 26,000 objects, roughly the size of your cell phone, all the way up to uh, the space station. Um, we understand some of the sources of the population. We understand some of the sinks, but we don't understand all of these completely. Out of those 26,000 objects that are uh, orbiting the Earth, roughly about 3,000 are things that work. Everything else is garbage and we plan on adding many, many more uh, in the next few years. And the reason I say assumed space object population is because, well, people hypothesize that there are roughly about half a million objects that we should be concerned about uh, that could threaten a lot of the services and capabilities that Manu just uh, talked to you about, all these great, the, 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 the flowers that are basically destroying the ecosystem and all that, so nothing really protects these services and capabilities uh, against uh, disruption or degradation of services. The current trackable population uh, looks something like this, and uh, this is something that we developed at UT Austin, and basically it combines multiple databases of objects, and I'll get to where there are uh, some things that you should be concerned about uh, here in a few slides. So there's several planned sources to the space object population soon. This is just a few of them. Uh, certainly, uh, it's, it's not all of them. And you can see that uh, our, our friend and fellow Elon Musk wants to add a significant number of objects uh, to this population in the near future. You have Amazon as well, OneWeb, uh, that want to put things on orbit. But I'm not going to ask you to strain your eyes to count. Uh, uh, let me just move on to the next thing, which is another depiction of that. And basically, you can see orbital altitude here on the x-axis, number of objects here on the y-axis. And the thing that you should be concerned about is that these circles kind of are grouped and overlap with each other. I mean, if they were completely separate, then you could say, okay, well, everybody has their own lanes in the highway and everybody's going to stay away from each other. But you can see that some of these folks want to uh, share uh, a common uh, uh, orbital environment. And so we need to really think about that carefully and, and how that might be impacted. One of the things that I find very, very interesting is that, in general, when we talk about sustainability, and especially like the long-term sustainability goals of, of the United Nations COPUS, nowhere is it mentioned about how other people on the planet have achieved that. And I think no, no better example than the indigenous people of the world. Uh, you know, you have the Inuit in the Arctic, you have the Aborigines, uh, you have the Maori in New Zealand, you have pockets of people that have thrived for thousands of years in harsh environments where uh, they've recognized that the resource is finite and they need to achieve a balance. And so this is captured in so-called traditional ecological knowledge. And I believe that this is foundational. The indigenous people of the world have a voice uh, and have something to teach us about how we could engage in sustainable behavior in near-Earth space. So here are some tenets of traditional ecological knowledge that you can find on your own, but and interestingly enough, factual observations, right? The development of things like taxonomies and, and models, understanding the relationship between things and how they affect each other. One of the things that I see in our community, unfortunately, is people making decisions that are uh, beyond science, okay? That's not so good. Uh, one of the tenets of ecological knowledge is slow down, make some observations, and base, make decisions that are evidence-based. And I see that uh, in the United States, we say you're in front of the headlights as a way to kind of say, you know, we are, we are acting in ways that go beyond the science. For instance, uh, we have some people in orbit that have already automated uh, maneuvers, okay? And they're, they're, they're 
uh, automating these maneuvers based on the data that they get from the U.S. Department of Defense. Guess what's not a perfect product? The product of the U.S. Department of Defense. Um, these things have errors. Uh, they're susceptible to type 1, type 2 errors, these sorts of things. So automating your system based on something that you know that might be flawed just because you believe in automation. Automation is not the enemy. Stupid automation is, okay? And, and, and uninformed automation is. And so what I'm saying is slow down, gather some evidence, and make some informed decisions. Understanding that near-Earth space is a finite resource, first and foremost. Uh, it's a shared finite resource. And can we uh, quantify the capacity of that orbital environment to sustain safe operations and traffic, right? And, and use that as a way to manage that system. Uh, look at how this is being used. It's being contested geopolitically, commercially, uh, ethics and values. Do we just want to do what's legal or do we want to do what is ethically correct? Uh, so these are all things that we should think about as we move forward and certainly, again, all tenets of traditional ecological knowledge. All right, so there's a lot of stuff happening on orbit. Here's the set of everything that's happening. That set as a whole is not knowable. So within that set, okay, we have beliefs, things that we hypothesize, and we have things that we measure. One of uh, the things that I tell all my students is, if you want to know something, you have to measure it. And if you want to understand something, you have to predict it, okay? To know something, you have to measure it. To understand it, you have to predict it. And so where, the b where our beliefs, our hypotheses, and the evidence overlap, that's inferred knowledge. Uh, but you might say, oh, okay, well, here's this guy on stage, and clearly uh, maybe he failed ki kindergarten. He can't color between the lines because this circle kind of extends outside of the circle. So that was purposeful. We actually have beliefs that aren't true, okay? We as scientists make hypotheses and have beliefs that are not true. And uh, I have another thing to tell you about our sensors. Our sensors are biased and are corrupt and our sensors can report things that are not true either. So we have to live in a world where we have beliefs that are not true and we have sensors that are reporting things that are not true as well. Traditional ecological knowledge lives at the nexus of these three spheres. Ethics, again, norms of behavior. We have some great guidelines, adopted guidelines in UN Copios, long-term sustainability, prevention of an arms race in outer space, and so on. Practice. Turns out some of us have been doing the space thing for a while. People in this room have been doing the space thing for a while. What are uh, lessons learned to prevent other people from making some of the same mistakes? What's our trade craft and how we behave in space? And how do we share that knowledge? Gathering evidence, sharing that evidence scientifically in a broad way, in a way that's very transparent. Uh, we have to understand causal relationships and understand our connection, even cultural connections uh, with that environment. So there's this thing called space situational awareness. Just think of that as uh, decision-making knowledge in space. So I say we need three things. Uh, we need transparency. We need uh, to predict things quite well. And we need accountability, OK? Uh, right now, we have a he said, she said situation in space. And I'll explain that a little bit. And we should, that's not good uh, for us as a, as a global society. When it comes to predictability, cultural competency also plays a role. We have these UN COPOS guidelines. OK, so 93 countries uh, uh, signed uh, to this by consensus. Question is, how will Arabic countries implement this? Do you believe that it'll be the same way as you will? Do you believe it's the same way as the Americans? No, because there's a cultural interpretation of the same words. And be, you know, acting like that's not a thing is naive at best. So that's something that we have to wrestle with, is we need to be culturally competent as we engage in sustainable uh, behavior in the domain. Some essential ingredients for success. We need an independent uh, way to do space object and event behavior quantification, monitoring, and assessment. Personally speaking, I believe that one of the strengths of Switzerland is this idea of neutrality and, and being able to establish maybe something like that here, to me, would make a lot of sense. Uh, we know one of my colleagues at the University of Bern, uh, Tomas Schildnik, is really good at this stuff, and so I think uh, you know working with him on something like that would be great. 
We need sustainability metrics. You know, right now we have Muriel, she is gonna lead this whole uh, clear space thing, that's awesome. And, and okay, there's some objects, we, we know that the large stuff becomes smaller stuff, and, and many stuff. So let's remove large things first. Okay, no brainer. But the thing is, until we can quantify the burden of any given object on the sustainability and the safety of others, we have a problem. We have a problem in monetizing things, insurance companies would sure like to know. And so things like a space traffic footprint that could be like a carbon footprint analog would be good to develop. And then again, maybe use these tenets of traditional ecological knowledge to move forward. The space traffic footprint, just loosely here, is again, think, think of the burden that any given object imposes on safety and sustainability of anything else, dead or alive. So when I get in my vehicle in the morning, as soon as I uh, turn the car on and start to back up, I am now a burden to other pedestrians and other drivers. They have to take me into account to be safe, okay? So that's kind of what I'm talking about. One of the things, surely, about this footprint is that it has to be independently measurable, it has to be updated periodically. So these are things that I'm working with, uh, you know, MIT Media Lab uh, as part of this uh, World Economic Forum Space Sustainability Rating. What happens when we don't share information? Partial knowledge can lead to wrong decisions, right? So you have people arguing, oh, I see a sphere in space. Oh, but I see a cube. Which one is it? Well, maybe you're both right and you're both in an absolute sense, wrong. This is why we have to combine as many different opinions as possible so that we can get to something that is truer. When I told you about the catalog and different opinions, if you go to spacetrack.org and download all the two-line elements without looking at the debris, that's what you'll see. And you say, okay, that's my space traffic map. So what? Well, that's what the Russians believe, okay? These things are not the same. That's what I'm trying to tell you, if you haven't been able to deduce that already. Here's an example. One object that belongs to Planet Lab, Flock 1C10. One object, four different opinions. Who's right? So we don't even agree on where the stuff is, okay? How do you know that you have the world's most accurate clock? Anybody? You'd say, oh, well, this is Switzerland. I mean, come on. <laughs> so the right answer is that you have hundreds of them. You have hundreds of atomic clocks around the globe, and you combine all these things, you figure out what the centroid is, the berry center of that, and you know how accurate you are based on your distance to that berry center, okay? If you're not familiar with berry center, we can talk about that offline. Probability of collision is a subjective thing. Ignorance and randomness are not the same thing, but we quantify all the uncertainty as if it was all due to randomness. Let me tell you something real quick without getting too deep into the weeds. There's this thing called a covariance matrix that people use nowadays to compute these probabilities of collision. You know what happens when I make the uh, covariance matrix infinitely large? The probability of collision goes to zero. That's how the math works. So let me ask you a quick question. How many people in this room believe that the less I know, the smaller my collision risk is? Right, there you go. I don't need to say any more. All right, so there's this really cool sensor called the Space Surveillance Telescope. It's now in Australia, built by DARPA through MIT Lincoln Lab. And here's the, here's the cool thing about it. The, the, the cool thing about it is that it detects lots of stuff. The bad thing about it is that it detects lots of stuff. So this is a single night's worth of detections all the things in black are things that it detected and we assume we know what it is and everything else is unknown. And this is what it does every night, every night. So we can't just try to make things detectable, we need to make things trackable. And trackable means detectable and identifiable. We need to be able to put a first and last name to objects in space. Just detecting by itself, not good enough. Another way to say it, most of the stuff up there does not report its identity, turns out. So you collect data at different times, and somehow, without actually physically going up to these things, you have to solve that identity crisis. How do we do that with math, with physics, with multimodal data? This is a challenge that's still salient. Maybe this is something that we can collaborate on together and, and, and with clear space, you know, while it transits uh, uh, you know, to getting things and bringing things back, maybe that we could add some space-based capabilities. That would be quite awesome. We'd love to be able to develop a taxonomy we start with things that we measure again. To know it, you have to measure it, right? 
what are we measuring? What combination of these measurable things gives us physical characteristics? What combination of these gives us functional object, you know, operational properties? And can we put a first and last name as much as possible to all the trackable objects in space? So given that I have 10 seconds over, uh, basically the way ahead is this, right? We have to really hit a home run in transparency, accountability, and predictability in the domain. We have to recognize that nearer space is a finite resource, okay? Outer space may be infinite. The space that we care about to provide all the services and capabilities is finite. Most of the stuff that we put there are on specific highways. We don't launch things into random orbits because that doesn't make a whole lot of sense for multiple reasons. We have to have a method to independently monitor, assess, and quantify this stuff. You know, India blew up this satellite, uh, you know, uh, not that long ago. It said 45 days, everything's going to re-enter. Then you have other people around the globe that say, hey, I'm still tracking some of the debris generated by that, uh, you know, ASAT test. Who do you believe? Unless you have the data, uh, you can't independently corroborate that. I would say that the world's indigenous people have something to teach us. I'm the first one who's going to accept that I have something to learn from them, and that's going to be m foundational to my uh, message as I go gallivanting around the world speaking to folks like yourselves. Uh, number of technical challenges that are still salient. Uh, absence of open accessible evidence and benchmark data is a significant hindrance. Confirmation bias is a major problem in our community. And uh, I leave you with this quote because I firmly believe in it. And uh, I'm very doubtful. All right. Thank you very much. <laughs>